So we know that the climates are changing um, and we know that they are drastically affecting the global ocean and the species that rely on that global ocean, including us humans. And we have a meteorologist here today and an ocean ecologist. So why not use this time and the knowledge that we both have to talk about Irish water, uh, Irish ocean and how it affects the Irish people. So the first question I'd like to ask you is, what's the difference between weather and climate? Well, I suppose uh, climate is what you expect and weather is what you get. And another way of looking at it is climate is really all the clothes that you have in your wardrobe and weather is what you wear from day to day. Uh, climate is the weather, at, you know, it varies from place to place depending on your location on the planet, your latitude, your longitude. At our location, um, at 50 degrees north, our climate is very variable and our weather is very variable. But still, we note that in the summer, we won't get temperatures much above 30 degrees and these would be an exception, whereas 30 degrees in Greece is just a mild summer's day. So while the weather on some of the days in Ireland are very warm, we could get touching 30, our climate for the summer would be more temp temperatures more like 20 degrees celsius so that's kind of the difference if you like so how is a warming ocean going to affect irish weather and climate well i suppose it's really only in the last 20 to 30 years that meteorologists and climatologists have just begun to understand how pivotal a role that uh, the ocean plays in the climatology the meteorological uh, mo modeling and really in determining the weather and the climate on planet Earth. Really, um, that's why we call uh, Earth the blue planet because 70% of the planet is actually covered in water. And I think it was really with the uh, very famous iconic um, photograph taken by the Apollo 8 astronauts in 1968 called Earthrise. This is considered one of the most iconic and most important environmental pictures ever taken because it was just realized then, oh, Earth is blue. And really since then, since 1968, we've put enormous research and our understanding of the ocean uh, has progressed enormously. So in, in quick terms, um, the ocean takes in most of the energy from the sun and then distributes that energy across the planet. So the tropics heats up, the tropical waters, the sea temperature at the tropics could be in the low to mid thirties. And then that the ocean currents then move that heat up towards the poles and then vice versa, the cold polar waters move southwards, called the great conveyor belt system. And here at our latitudes, we can thank the North Atlantic Drift or the Gulf Stream for our temperate climate. So without that, we'd be absolutely freezing in winter. And in fact, this was discovered by Benjamin Franklin. He was the postmaster general in Britain at the time and noticed that the uh, ships bringing the post from America over to Europe came over much quicker than vice versa. And the sailors at the time, the, the mariners had identified this Gulf Stream wind and ocean current. While a lot of us complain about the weather in Ireland, there is a reason that Ireland is green and we can thank the Gulf Stream for that, that great ocean current. And of course, there's many currents right around the globe and it's of vital importance really uh, for the well-being of the citizens on Earth and really led to, if you like, evolution. And it's very humbling actually to think that without the ocean we wouldn't even exist as a species because all life began beneath the oceans um, many hundreds of millions of years ago before the ozone layer really was properly formed. The oceans prevented a barrier uh, protecting the developing life, protecting them from the harmful UV rays from the sun. So really the oceans gave us our life and continues to sustain it. And this is why we should really look after our oceans and cherish our oceans. So I know that the Marine Institute has six offshore buoys around Ireland, uh, but what kind of information do those buoys provide to you and Met Erin? Firstly, I suppose, and most importantly, to the mariner and in particular the rescue services, the measurements of wave height, 
air temperature, sea temperature, air pressure, and wind speed and direction. How important is that information for you in Met Erin to keep Irish people safe? But particularly here in Met Erin, the forecaster really uses the uh, real-time buoy data when we write out and uh, construct our sea area forecast. And in particular, the M6 uh, buoy out in the Atlantic gives vital information on swell waves generated by those Atlantic storms. So even though the weather and the winds can be calm around our shores, there could be some very high swells coming in from those Atlantic storms, and it's the M6 who gives us this vital information. This is augmented now by satellite information. Do we provide information to the rest of Europe using our Irish boys? The uh, Marine Institute boy readings are fed directly into the computer models run by, first of all, MetAaron, our high resolution models, but also into the global model run by ECMWF, that's the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasting. Now this global model is used by all forecasters right around the world and gives guidance, first of all, uh, good guidance up to 10 days ahead. Particularly now we are developing more uh, skill in seasonal forecasting, forecasting the El Nino phenomenon and also in hurricane forecasting. Along with the help of these boys, how do you construct the forecasts that go out daily to the Irish people? Well, it's a long story, as I said, st starting um, many hundreds of years ago, I suppose in the pre-scientific era, uh, our farmers and mariners looked to signs from nature, but now it is based on science and starting, we start with the observations first of all, and that's why the boys are very important, and all the ships at sea, the uh, aircraft through the air and augmented now by 10,000 surface observatories right around the world. Um, so we start with a picture of the weather, let's say at midday today, and then using the laws of physics of the atmosphere, the uh, really sophisticated weather models project on the state of the atmosphere at future time intervals. So in MetAaron we have what we call a high resolution model, which we calculate the weather uh, every two and a half uh, kilometers, and we are in the process of reducing this, so that's it's becoming even higher of higher resolution and then we move on that up to uh, about 54 hours ahead and then we base our forecasts on this uh, weather model and we run it 11 different times this is called an ensemble system and this is the the latest in uh, developments in weather forecasting and we've just developed this uh, in 2020 this ensemble forecasting we, we use our METERN models to issue the sea area forecast, the gale warnings, the small craft warnings, and also the weather warnings that you hear now and the storm naming. Uh, storm naming, by the way, um, goes back again hundreds of years when mariners who crossed the Atlantic would meet the very powerful hurricanes uh, in the Caribbean. They were called after, if you like, saints, saints names, and then you had name, typhoons, and cyclones you know, on the other side of the world. But really at our latitudes, we've only begun to name storms in the last couple of years. Met Aaron in conjunction with our colleagues in the UK Met Office and also in um, KNMI in the Netherlands, we're in a storm naming uh, group, if you like. So um, we opened it up to the public uh, last summer and we got 3,000 entries. So. Uh, you know, people like to think that maybe they they could be called after a storm. Although I think it's a bit of a double-edged sword because uh, do you really want your child your child's name associated with a violent, destructive force that could cause damage? But anyway, <laughs> we're naming storms at the moment, and it's not, it's not a gimmick. It's really to sort of. Uh, get the message across that there are serious winds on the way and we can only issue storm warnings now three to four days ahead because of these very powerful weather models numerical weather prediction and for those as I said we need as much observations as much ground truth as possible and that's why the data from weather boys not only around Ireland, but across the Atlantic and across the vast Pacific Ocean are so important.
As a forecaster, have you started to see any worrying trends between Ireland and our climate? Well, Ireland lies um, in the middle latitude, so our weather is very variable. Our weather patterns are dominated by um, the clash of two air masses, polar Arctic air clashing with warm, warmer tropical air. And the clash zone actually was first identified by a very famous Norwegian meteorologist called Wilhelm Bjørknes in the early 1900s. And he likened it to the Western Front in the First World War. So that's why we call it a weather front. It's like a clash of two armies, a cold air army and warm air army. And where the two air masses clash at the front, we get this band of rain. So uh, the average position of that polar front in winter is about 50 degrees north. And that's the average, or not the average, that's the location of Ireland. So uh, right around the globe at 50 degrees north, you get this undulating weather front. So when we're on the warm side of the front, the weather is very mild, obviously. So that's why if the polar front is north of us in winter, we can get very mild winters. And that's why sometimes on Christmas day, you can get temperatures of 13 or 14 degrees it's because the polar front is north of us. But if it's south of us, then we're obviously into the Arctic air and then we get a really cold winter like uh, 2010 and get a lot of snow. Um, now the trick, of course, as a meteorologist is to be able to predict is the polar front going to be north of us or south of us? And that's where the weather models come in. Now, they give a very, really excellent idea up to about 10 days ahead. But the ECMWF uh, Centre is uh, developing some more skill in uh, forecasting for seasons ahead. And that's trying to predict where the polar front will be. But on a day-to-day -day basis, our weather, as a forecaster, our weather, you're tracking small scale disturbances and our weather is just as variable as it used to be. But there are signs that we are getting into more blocking situations and that we are getting into more extremes. So we still have the variable undulations of the polar front, but it does seem that you know, we're getting more stuck on the warm side or on the cold side for longer periods. And this is what leads to more extreme weather events and can lead to more flooding across Europe, across North America, depending on which side of the polar front you are. So, so that does seem to be a, a, a very, very worrying trend in our weather.